So thanks folks for joining us uh, for emergency scene traffic uh, control course. Uh, this is one of the components of the uh, playbook uh, required training for exterior operations firefighter. And we've, tip we've, been, uh, we've been working our way through a lot of these modules. And uh, this is a new course uh, that we've been able to develop in house uh, with the assistance of Rick Ryan Lewis. So I wanted to thank him as well for his assistance in putting this together. Uh, he's been great at uh, going around to all your departments and uh, delivering this training. And uh, now he's made it available for us to deliver in-house and uh, any of our training officers can use this. So appreciate you coming here. All right, so we do have uh, basically a lesson outline here. Uh, so you, I'm gonna be doing the classroom presentation today. There will be a written test. Uh, it says up here you need 75% on this one. So we're going to keep with that standard. Uh, there is a practical session that's required as well. So after you complete the test, once we're able to get back together with our uh, fire departments, uh, the, our hope is that uh, you'll be able to take some time with your training officers and, uh, and be able to uh, sign off on the practical skills component of this as well. And uh, you see the JPRs that are listed right there. And as I mentioned, this is a part of the, uh, of the uh, British Columbia Fire Services minimum training standards playbook. Uh, so for exterior operations, this is a required course. Sean, just a, a quick question. If we've already, if we already are certified to do emergency scene traffic control, we won't have to take the test, correct? That's right, Dylan. If you already have it, you'd no need to do it. And I appreciate you coming back out. And uh, every time you see these things, maybe you can get a little more out of it uh, as we do different presentations. So thanks, Dylan. All right, so again, the purpose of this course is to improve the safety of our emergency personnel um, at, uh, and roadway users and others at incident scenes. So again, the information presented in this course, it's, it's meant to increase first responder awareness and the hazards that are associated with roadway emergency incidents. Uh, and it helps us to uh, have the knowledge that we need to minimize the risk and maximize our safety. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, also information to help us meet the job performance requirements that we need to do our job. Um, we as responding personnel, we need to be able to recognize the inherent risks with these types of emergencies on roadways. Uh, members also have to be able to accept responsibility for their own safety as well as the safety of others at the scene and make sure that we're taking appropriate steps to reduce risk me. or exposure and not become victims of, at the scene our, ourselves. Uh, we don't want to, we don't use our fire trucks to transport victims to an emergency scene. And, uh, and one of the ways we make sure of that is knowing that we're well-trained and, uh, and able to do our job effectively. And part of that is uh, emergency scene traffic. So again, during this, uh, during this lesson, we're gonna discuss a few things. Operational guidelines we'll get into a bit, uh, job performance requirements, um, recommended practical procedures of how to actually do the job we're, we're gonna be expected to do, uh, and, and general safety at an emergency scene, because as we know, safety is our number one priority. So again, <sighs> We're going to want to uh, understand, explain, be able to demonstrate uh, relevant M uh, motor vehicle accident regulations, uh, standard operating guidelines, which we do have. And uh, we, I ask that I hope that you're familiar with our standard operating guidelines in the CSRD. Um, how to mount and dismount apparatus uh, and operate in a protected area. Uh, how to identify emergency scene equipment. Uh, how to deploy traffic and scene control devices. And, really just how to uh, direct traffic safely uh, using correct arm signals and communications at emergency scenes. So when we talk about roadway incident management, really we're talking about a three-part process, all right? At the beginning we get there, uh, it, well, before we even get there, there's a preparation and planning stage. So we're getting ourselves ready uh, for the response. Uh, part of that is this, the training that you're doing today. Uh, the second part of the process, of course, is the response itself. We get called out. It's, there's an emergency on a roadway we need to attend, uh, and we're going to head out there to do that. Um, and the last one is downgrading and termination, because downgrading and termination is a section where as we're starting to take everything apart and, and it's time to go home, uh, we're demobilizing, and uh, it is a, it is, there is a heightened risk now because we're starting to remove uh, some of the things that have been keeping us safe on this emergency scene. So we'll go through these three steps, and these are going to be the big overarching themes for uh, for uh, our lesson today. 
So again, like uh, so the first one that we talked about, it's going to be about preparation and planning. So after this unit, uh, I'm hoping that everyone will understand, you know, how regulations and guidelines are uh, applied to them uh, as uh, as it uh, relates to emergency scene traffic control. So this the completion of this uh, program allows you to direct traffic at emergency scenes for a maximum of two hours. All right, and that's an emergency scene for two hours. This is not a full fledged traffic flaggers course. That is a much longer course. Uh, people go to and uh, there's a lot more to it uh, to learn how to do that. So again, with what with the information you have this once you've completed this course you will have the skills and uh, knowledge required to be able to direct traffic at emergency scenes for two hours. Uh, and that is the regulation that WorkSafe uh, BC has set out. Now, I have had it asked it by me, it, to me before, what if it goes over two hours? We are not going to just cut and run from a scene. Now, the incident commander should be making every chance, every, uh, taking every chance they have to try and uh, get uh, professional flaggers out, a flagging company out uh, to, to take over as soon as possible. Um, it really does bother me at some times, I've seen it happen uh, with my own fire department, with fire departments here, that you know the highways contractors, the highways personnel, sometimes try to use us as you know, kind of free traffic control. Uh, you know, we're there, we're doing a job for safety. We're doing a job because we're fat, we're, we're there quicker. We're doing a job because we have another job to do and we need to keep our own personnel safe and other responders safe. We are not there to be used as free labor. Uh, and I just want to really make that clear that, uh, that, you know, we need to be working to try and get MOTI and aim the con highway contractor to send flaggers out as soon as we can to relieve our personnel so that we can do the job that we are, uh, you know, that we're trained to do, which is the rescue and response side of things. Um, uh, but I do want to reiterate again that if the flaggers do not show up in that two hours, that does not mean that we just pull our, our traffic control equipment up and leave. Uh, that would be an even more dangerous situation, obviously, depending on, on uh, what was going on around. Um, but, we do need, uh, but we do need to make it very clear that this is the standard that we're being held to and put a lot of pressure on those companies to send somebody out. Okay, so BC Motor Vehicle Act, Section 125, unless otherwise directed by a peace officer or person authorized by a peace officer to direct traffic, every driver of a vehicle and every pedestrian must obey the instructions of an applicable traffic control device. That means that you set up traffic control devices to, uh, to make your scene safe uh, and to control the flow of traffic through your emergency scene, the drivers are required to follow them, all right? Um, it's not just because, oh, it's just a volunteer fire department, we don't need to do that. No, we are a trained emergency response organization, and if we're putting up traffic control, uh, drivers are obligated to follow them. So we talked a bit about the Highway Traffic Act. Now there's also NFPA standards that relate to us, all right? NFPA standards are, are professional standards set by a very uh, high, uh, qualified body, uh, the National Fire Protection Association. And these standards really have a lot to do over with um, just about every aspect of, of the job we do. Uh, so for example, NFPA 1001, that is the firefighter professional qualifications. And these are the uh, the JPRs for the most part in the playbook that we are being held to. So when you see a job performance requirement, often there'll be a number beside it. Uh, that's referring to a specific NFPA code, and in this case, NFPA 1001 is that uh, uh, basically is a firefighter professional qualifications. 1410 training for emergency scene operations comes into play in this training. Uh, NFPA 1451 fire and emergency service vehicle operations training program. Uh, 1971, protective ensembles for structural firefighting and proximity firefighting. And NFPA 1091, traffic control incident management profess professional qualifications. So all of these have gone into making uh, this training program. And the BC Construction Safety Alliance are actually the ones who originally created this program. And we've modified it for our own means, uh, kind of expanded on it uh, in, in some ways. We certainly haven't taken anything out. Uh, but uh, we're, these are the standards that we're looking to meet with what uh, with the training we're doing today. All right, department 
SOGs, standard operating guidelines. So as firefighters, we must know and understand our opera operational guidelines. All right, it's very important that we understand and know our operational guidelines. Um, basically, they address the safety of all of the responders and the public at the emergency scene. Um, uh, we want to. We also want to address the fact that only trained and qualified personnel are used to do traffic control at scenes. It's not uh, acceptable to have uh, a rookie new on the department who hasn't taken this training yet uh, to be controlling traffic. They don't have the, the the qualifications. No longer are we. This is not a train on the job kind of uh, business that we're in. Too many risks. Too many hazards. The expectation is that uh, if you're going to be asked to do traffic control at a scene, that you have this training. And then uh, as well, what we cover in our standard operating guideline, which is on the slide up here. And again, I do uh, encourage you to go take a look at it. It's, it's OG 1.3.9 uh, under incident safety. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we're using appropriate equipment and PPE, including our helmet and a high vis uh, vest when we are uh, uh, directing traffic on a roadway or operating on a roadway. Anytime we're on, a uh, an active roadway we want to be wearing our high-vis vest and we'll talk more about that uh, later a little bit later in the course here so this is important and this is something that i have a lot of personal experience with the greatest th threat to the safety of emergency personnel at the scene of a roadway incident is oncoming vehicles we need to be prepared for the unexpected um, I'm going to tell you a little story uh, about uh, an incident that I was involved in in my previous department. Uh, we did road rescue in this department and we had arrived at, uh, at a call for uh, an overturned semi. Uh, semi had, had failed to negotiate uh, a corner, uh, had made it quite a ways around the corner before actually jackknifing and, and, uh, and going off the road. Um, we had arrived on scene and we knew it had been icy that day. We were in contact with the highways personnel with, uh, with the uh, authority having jurisdiction out there. And they were informing us that it was icy. So we were being very cautious on our way out. We want to we wanted make sure again, as we're responding, that we're responding appropriately uh, and nothing worse than for an apparatus to uh, cause its own accident. So we headed our way out there. We ended up getting to the scene uh, and stopping a little bit behind it. Uh, and uh, as we got there, we saw the semi was overturned, the driver was out of the vehicle, no extrication, that's great. So as the fire chief, I stepped out of, the, uh, out of my command vehicle and uh, I uh, spoke with a, a few fire personnel and two of them I asked to start setting up traffic control. They jumped into our command vehicle, had all the traffic safety and they went around and about three, 400 meters uh down the road to the to the west was uh was the corner that this this other semi had had a difficulty going around so they go they go around the corner and um i'm you know and i start walking towards the vehicle other people are you know helping the patient uh, bc ambulance is on scene they're trying to help them you know walking the the patient over uh to to the ambulance uh we had one firefighter and a paramedic on the other end I had two, uh, firefighters that were securing our rescue vehicle that had shown up so they were making sure it was positioned correctly having the chalk set I, I look down the road and i see a semi coming at us uh and it was doing a very high rate of speed and as it's coming at us, I can see that it's going too fast and that it's not, uh, and it's not even trying to apply the brakes at this point in time. And, and this is all happening very quickly. Um, about 100 meters from the corner, it starts to try to apply brakes. Uh, you see the wobble start happening. And I basically just started screaming at the top of my lungs for everyone to heads up and get off the shoulder, get off the shoulder of the road. Uh, at that point, everything went uh, kind of slowed right down. And I saw the semi full jackknife. Um, as I moved off the side of the road quickly, uh, the paramedics, uh, the paramedic and our firefighter who were helping the patient ended up scrambling off into the bush, other firefighters running off into the other ditch. But uh, I didn't see everybody. And uh, all, I, the next thing I see is the basically on the, I'm on the standing on the side of the road, looking across the road, and I see the, 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 the license plate of, at the rear uh, trailer of the semi going past me. Ended up, it ended up slamming into the, uh, into the ambulance, coming across the road, hitting our rescue vehicle, rolling down an embankment, uh, and then our rescue vehicle caught fire. 
And uh, my first thought, of course, was, uh, my goodness, somebody got taken out in this. There's no way we had 15 personnel on scene here and we, did, we got away unscathed. Fortunately, we did. Um, but it, it was a all too real reminder uh, of how dangerous it is on the roadways. Uh, we don't know when this kind of thing is going to happen. Yes, we knew it was icy. Um, and we ended up actually making a new SOG in situations like that, where we do a drive by, um, a, a drive by size up. We set the track, we, we either shut the highway down or set up traffic control on one side. And then we do Then we go back the other way, uh, either do a full shutdown or set up traffic control before, uh, responding to the emergency scene and, uh, and beginning our rescue operations. So those kind of things tend to tend to really open your eyes and make you think about the job you're doing and your safety and the safety of everybody that you're, you're working with as well. Um, and it really drives home the required, the importance of maintaining your situational awareness. If I hadn't been looking down the road at that time, if nobody had been looking down the road at that time and, and, and that semi had have come around, we would have had less time to respond. We would have had less time to get a, a, to scurry off the side of the road and get safe. Um, but we need to maintain that situational awareness. We don't turn our backs to traffic. We keep our eyes on the road and we keep our eyes up ahead. And uh, again, you should always be on alert when we're at these kind of scenes, right? So it's important for me to drive home the fact that every time we step out of that apparatus onto a roadway, we are at risk. We're a target. We're something else that a, that a car can hit. Um, and the safety of emergency responders, we've driven this home so many times, the safety of emergency responders is our primary safety concern. Our safety is our primary concern. Yes, we want to help the people in that accident. We didn't cause the accident. We need to make sure that we can help them. And the only way we can help them is if we make sure that we're keeping ourselves safe. So again, emergency personnel being injured or killed at roadway incidents, it's increasing in frequency. Uh, often there's a secondary incident that's going to happen while we are doing the job that we primarily that we initially came out to do. Um, the secondary incidents commonly involve emergency responders being struck by vehicles. So we want to make sure we're following appropriate procedures and that we remain keenly aware of our surroundings, what's going on around us, um, because that's really the only way to significantly increase our safety as responders. So yeah, so I mean, we know this, right? Dangerous drivers, there's, they're all, they have all, they, they show all these types of traits, right? Often they're going to be impatient, confused. They could be impaired. Perhaps they were drinking. And I have had, I come across situations of, of impaired drivers showing up at our scenes as well. Um, they may have hearing or sight difficulties. Uh, they're not paying attention. They're uh, rubbernecking is a very common thing that happens at our scenes. Uh, people want to see what happened. You know, they might have been waiting in traffic for two hours, but by the time they get to the front, they're going to be damned if they're going to just drive by the scene and not see what they've been waiting for for two hours. So they're they're not paying attention to the road. They're if you you can't just walk out in front of traffic at these places. Um, Often they're multitasking, perhaps they're doing, you know, on their on their mobile device, perhaps they're eating breakfast, doing their hair, doing whatever, um, but they're not paying attention to the job of driving uh, and their mind wandering, right? So we never assume that the driver of a motor vehicle is going to respond in a safe and responsible manner, right? We have to take all of this into consideration. Um, there are a lot of dangerous drivers out there, right? Uh, and these drivers are our biggest threat when we're responding on a roadway. So there are some da other dangers of uh, vehicular traffic. So car may, a truck car may come up and, and not be able to stop or fail to stop for one of the reasons we saw on the previous slide or for any other reason. And we, we may also experience intrusions into our work zone. Um, there are increased danger uh, risks of us being struck. Some drivers are going to panic when they arrive at emergency. Um, they may lose control of their vehicle or misjudge the situation entirely. And, and all of a sudden, they're up close and personal with the job we're doing. So a couple of unpredictable elements to the job we do, weather, traffic, right? Like the dangers uh, associated with working on roadway incidents can be really compounded by adverse weather conditions uh, and, and, adverse tra and, and uh, extreme traffic conditions as well. Um, the current local conditions need to be taken into account and into consideration 
at every incident that we that we go to. Uh, weather and traffic conditions can, may change throughout the duration of the incident, and we have, might have be required to make adjustments in order to compensate. We might get out there. It's beautiful out. Start snowing. It becomes icy on the on the way back. Well, that may, did we do we have enough space, uh, you know, to protect us? Do we have have we given enough warning to drivers to be able to slow down in adverse conditions, you know, um, and not just in in good weather, right? So we want to take all this into account, and uh, again, as well as with our response on the way out there, we need to we need to contend with the traffic. We need to contend with the weather on the way out there. Traffic, hopefully, our lights and sirens will help to get us through. Um, but again, not necessarily, depending on how busy it is. Uh, with the weather, we need to drive to conditions, right? Code three does not mean going 140 kilometers an hour every single time. It means driving to conditions. I often have to respond to code three out to distant areas of either Falkland, Area F with Anglemont, Solista, Scotch Creek, and it's a long drive when you've got uh, bad conditions on the roadways. Um, but, and, and I've often seen drivers that are driving faster without lights and sirens than I'm comfortable driving in that situation. And I'm going to make sure I'm arriving safely and we need to do the same every time. There's some other factors that can come into play, uh, things like low lighting, times when daylight's reduced and, uh, there's insufficient lighting, um, in situations like that, obviously drivers can easily become confused and maybe unable to see you. We've all experienced this when the sun's coming right in your eyes as you're driving. Uh, and so remember that, right? We take uh, kind of pay attention to where you're at in relation to the sun and to other scene lighting, right? Um, poor visibility um, could be from low lighting, weather conditions that can lead to driver confusion and panic. Um, inclement weather uh, that affects visibility, traction, reaction time, and stopping distances. Uh, traffic congestion uh, can, can uh, compound other problems and often makes drivers very frustrated. Uh, so they just want to get the heck out of that traffic. And, uh, you know, we're creating, uh, in a lot of cases, congestion behind us when we're setting up these uh, uh, emergency scenes. So people are getting frustrated. And just remember that you may, uh, may have some disgruntled drivers coming up, um, but we have to do the job we do safely. Uh, and uh, we'll get them on their way as soon as we can. Uh, the flashing lights, um, the excessive use of uh, it can cause, uh, you know, uh, visibility problems and confusion for drivers. So we do need to keep, uh, you know, emergency lights on, uh, on at least our, uh, uh, our uh, blocking vehicles. Um, but, you know, if there's a number of vehicles on the scene, you might want to think of turning a couple of them off if they're inside of, uh, you know, the buffer area or the work zone area. Uh, and uh, not the first thing they're being seen. I do recommend that if you have uh, a police officer there, you keep the blue lights going for a little while too, though that tends to slow drivers down a lot better than our red lights can uh, slow them down. Uh, and then we got glare vision down on the on the screen there. So again, temporary blindness caused, caused by, you know, headlight glare or scene lighting can also cause it. Um, it's, you know, recovery, when it goes from, uh, from dark to light back to dark again, uh, the recovery can take, you know, six seconds, um, like from light to dark, and it can take, uh, as long as three seconds from dark to light. So it takes a little bit of time for our eyes to adjust and for people to actually see what's going on again. So roadside safety is no accident, right? Emergency responders often uh, contribute to their own danger uh, by engaging in what we call operational indifference, right? We're just, oh, I can't believe I'm out here again. I gotta do the damn traffic, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we need to always maintain our situational awareness, right? And I think that story I told you uh, of my experience with the semi going sideways um, and then uh, the best part, another good part about that was three people came out of a two seater cab, uh, crawled out of that at the end as well, and then wanted to use my cell phone. But uh, we need to maintain our situational awareness uh, on these uh, on these calls at all time. Right. So we need to protect ourselves. We're not going to wander into traffic. Um, we're going to try to check the traffic before we even exit the apparatus. We want to take a look around, make sure we're safe. Uh, we want to make sure we're wearing our proper PPE and uh, reflective clothing. 
Um, we want to make sure we have adequate lighting. There's enough warning devices. We've set them up properly. We've established that traffic control and limit our exposure to danger, right? We are not gonna be standing out on the roadway or right close to where traffic can hit us. Uh, as you'll see, as we go on there will, you know, we're gonna be placing things in, a, in, uh, in our way to try and create buffers and barriers to protect us, use them, stay behind them. Uh, we don't wanna put another target out on the highway. I would rather somebody hit into one of our apparatus, destroy a half million dollar vehicle than for any way uh, injure or even worse, kill one of our members or responders. Uh, we use our apparatus for blocking. Um, protect yourself with it. Stay behind it when you can. So again, we want to always consider who and what is protecting you. Complacency kills. And that is absolutely true for roadway incidents, right? This is what, these are some of the most dangerous calls we're gonna go on for us. Uh, you know, we can mitigate risks at a structure fire call by doing, you know, hit it from the yard. And then, and, and then if we can, you know, look at making a transitional attack at some point in time. Um, there are ways that, we, you know, we can mitigate other risks by, you know, protecting exposures for, you know, cooling down propane tanks. And we do minimize our risks here, but if we, aren't, if we aren't paying attention, if we don't maintain our situational awareness, bad things can happen very, very quickly, right? We, we often, uh, some responders can operate with an attitude of uh, complacency and, and then they'll fail to follow the operational procedures and they're gonna put themselves at, at, at pretty extreme risk. All right, so with preparation planning, scene safety, working in or near a moving traffic environment is extremely dangerous. If, I, if you haven't got that through yet, I don't know how else to put it to you, but the, the organized placement of uh, apparatus and equipment is absolutely important. The way that we do it, where we put it, needs to be well thought out uh, to ensure our safety. On a, uh, on a roadway, we can create safer working conditions for our responders if we do the right things, right? Um, we are working in a moving and constantly changing environment when we're on a roadway, uh, which is why we need to maintain the situational awareness. Um, but we can, re we can reduce the risk through our awareness, teamwork, communication, and training. We've all seen this before, probably in other, course, in other courses uh, that you've taken. Um, and for those of you who are new, maybe you haven't seen this yet, but these, are, these uh, don't uh, change very much uh, de uh, de regardless of what kind of call we're going to. Uh, when we're looking at our priorities, the number one priority is always going to be the safety of the crew, the safety of our emergency responders. That comes first, right? Responders must not forget your own well-being. We can't do anything to help others if we get injured. And nobody has joined these departments with the uh, with the hope that they're gonna or with the expectation or hope that they're gonna get injured. Everyone's doing it to help, and we all want to go home at the end of the day, right? So our second priority after our own safety is going to be the safety of the public and patients, right? Uh, the condition and needs of the public at the scene must be secured before the traffic control is implemented, right? Unless manpower allows for a designated firefighter to handle traffic requirements right upon arrival we need to you know make sure we're safe get ourselves out of the way try to remove others from the way if we can and then you know it would be our next way our next thought uh, and the safety of the scene comes last but that's in some cases the scene is what's going to protect both us and the public right but uh you know as far as keeping that car that's been hit safe i don't care so much right it's that's the, if there's nobody in it that's not my issue it's people that we're out to try and uh, protect here um, so when they say that the safety of the scene is third, it doesn't mean that it's not important, right? Responders have to assess the risk uh, of the location and, design, and, and really decide what, uh, what, what's necessary to protect the crew and the public for, uh, from traffic uh, while we're operating at the scene, right? We want to make sure it's safe to enter the scene upon arrival and look for any underlying hazards. Um, things like electrical wires, right? What about hazardous materials? Uh, too often we, we end up, uh, you know, heading out, we're in our apparatus, we're responding to a scene uh, and we just kind of go beeline straight for it and we jump out of the truck and it's like, oh my God, we've just placed ourselves in a hazardous, uh, you know, in, in a hazmat spill uh, environment or the last, you know, or uh, an electrical wires being down. Again, we put ourselves too close to them and we put ourselves in jeopardy by doing that. So we need to be aware of those, uh, of those possibilities as well as we're responding. 
All right, so personal protective equipment. Um, I, you know, if I, if we were doing this in person, I'd like to have, you know, I'd probably have a traffic control vest out with me and a helmet, but uh, these are the requirements, uh, you know, the WorkSafe BC requirements uh, as far as operating at a road scene, right? So a WorkSafe BC approved high visibility garment must be worn over your uniform or turnout coat at all times when directing traffic, all right? So just using your turnout gear, which does have reflective material on it, is not enough when operating on a roadway. We need to be wearing these traffic vests, all right? Use them, put them on uh, every single time. If you're at a structure fire and you're having to be on a roadway, you're maybe you're the pump operator, put on a, put on a vest, right? If you're gonna have traffic going by you and, there, and there's a chance you're gonna be out on the roadway, put it on, all right? Um, this is required. Um, they have to be fluorescent colored, uh, they have to be on a fluorescent colored background. Uh, so it has to be either lime green or orange or the yellow. Um, has to have a vertical band of reflective material on either side of the chest and it has to have an X on the back and a, uh, and a horizontal stripe around the waist. All right, so you can see the two stripes coming down on the vest here. If we were to look at the back, it would have an X on the back in the high vis as well, and it has that reflective stripe going around the waist. All right, the band also has to have the fluorescent trill, uh, trim the opposite color of the vest, right? So in this case, you've got a yellow vest and orange trim. Uh, the reflective material on uh, it must be kept clean and visible. You must be able to see it. So if it gets dirty, we need to make sure that it's still reflective and clean it off. Um, and uh, reflective banks must be, uh, uh, must be a minimum of five centimeters wide and uh, combined for a total of 200 square inches. So again, that's just talking about how much reflective. They have to have quite a bit of reflective material on these high-vis uh, vests as well. And you'll notice here, it does say helmet must be worn at all times. So the helmet and the vest are the two pieces that you cannot, uh, that you have no choice over. You need to be wearing your helmet, you need to have your vest on, and your helmet should have high-vis uh, stickers on it as well somewhere. John, yes. one of the problems we do have out on the roads is we do have a safety officer quite often and also a command officer and their jackets are not actually high vis. Should they be strictly wearing a high vis at that point? Uh, well, they are and they aren't. You're right in that the, they, they don't have the lime green, the orange, the yellow. Um, in those situations, we, we, we actually expect them to be wearing the, the incident command and the safety vests. Uh, and again, these are jobs that are, are designed to keep people safe as well. Now, being aware that you're not necessarily wearing, you know, the most reflective, they certainly should not be put in, in uh, you know, you shouldn't be directing traffic in those vests, but wearing those vests as an incident commander, as a safety officer is, is acceptable. Okay, so traffic control equipment. Um, basically, the equipment must meet the standards of WorkSafe BC. All right, uh, so there are four devices that we use to control traffic safely. Uh, so the first thing, the traffic uh, control paddles, all right? Um, they have to conform to uh, the Ministry of Transportation's traffic control manual on, for work on roadways uh, and WorkSafe BC standards. Uh, pan, the the uh, paddles have to be uh, standard. They're called C27 stop slow. Uh, paddles and they have to have, have encapsulated lens reflective sheeting, so a very, ref like very reflective signs that uh, when uh, headlights are flashed on them, it will reflect back at the driver. Uh, and these must be used at all times by, by the person that's directing traffic. Always have to have a, uh, a paddle. Uh, support staffs can be used uh, uh, as you need them uh, anytime that the person directing traffic wants to. Uh, and really what that is, is uh, it, help, it helps prevent uh, fatigue, uh, repetitive strain injury. It's just a longer uh, pull at the bottom of the paddle. Instead of just having the paddle, it actually rests on the ground. Uh, but when, when you're dealing with one of these, they have to be non-conductive. So the handle itself must be made of plastic, wood, or metal with a rubber boot on the bottom of it. All right, so we don't wanna be sticking a metal pole into the ground when maybe there's a, a wire down, uh, you know, too close to us. The third piece of traffic control uh, uh, device used to control traffic safety, 
uh, are basically flashlights and wands and other types of lighting devices. Um, basically, there are attachments for flashlights that you can put on that will put them make them into a wand. Uh, LED wands uh, are also can also be purchased that uh, blink in different patterns. Um, a red or orange wand must be used while directing traffic at night and during times of poor visibility. So this is required as well. Anytime you're working at night or there's poor visibility, you need to be using a, uh, a, a wand. And uh, wands can also be used at any time for any for additional visibility. Uh, basically, just and it's also an extension of your arm, just allows you to be a little bit more uh, clear in your direction to motorists. And the final uh, item that we have here on the traffic control equipment are the two-way radios. Uh, these are necessary for everything we do, right? This is communication. Communication is safety. Um, they're going to be necessary when there's poor visibility or the design of the scene makes it necessary for the people directing traffic to use radios uh, to, in, just in order to communicate with each other. If I can see my, if I'm doing directing traffic and I can see the other person directing traffic at the other side of the roadway there, you know, we can we can use a set of hand signals and that's fine. Um, but you'll find a lot of times we're setting up scenes that are so long or they travel and they end up being around a corner or there's other things that are blocking our sight lines or making it too far for voice and the hand signals to work, uh, that having this radio uh, is absolutely required to be able to communicate effectively. And then there are channeling devices. All right, so these are visible barriers, uh, visual barriers at the emergency scene, right? These are things that people will see. Uh, and yeah, if they ran over it, it wouldn't do much to stop the vehicle itself, but people just uh, automatically, uh, you know, you uh, definitely look to avoid them. And uh, it tells them that they're at an emergency scene or some kind of scene where traffic is, uh, is not flowing in its typical pattern, right? And there's all different types, but um, the type B uh, is a 45 centimeter or type C is a 70 centimeter cone. Um, these are used to delineate the work areas. So that's the traffic cones. Uh, there are tubular markers there you see in the center. Uh, these are mandatory when the speed limit is uh, 70 kilometers an hour or higher. And then there are flexible drums that are used at higher speeds. So if you get into uh, very fast speeds, those larger ones can be used as well. Uh, so each one must be reflective for night use and maximum visibility, all right? We can't have, if you have cones on your truck that don't have high visibility on them, they're no good to you as far as a roadway incident. You can use them for driver training or whatever else you wanna use or an obstacle course, but you can't use it on the roadway if it doesn't have the reflective, uh, the reflective material on there. Okay, signage. So many of you have these. Uh, I'm, a number, I'm sure you've seen them if you've uh, if you've gone to any calls on roadways. Uh, it's the accident or emergency scene ahead sign. Uh, these are always recommended at the high, at higher speeds. You know, 70 kilometers and up. Definitely want to look at putting one of those out. But it doesn't hurt to put it out on you know on on slower roadways as well. If I was working on Squilax Anglemont Road and and you know in a 60 area, I might still want to be putting these on. Um, it, it, what they do is they provide additional warning to motorists that there's a potential, that there's a potential hazard up ahead before they even reach the accident scene. It just gives them time to prepare, start slowing down, take their foot off before they see it and end up panicking and, and having to uh, slam on brakes. And that's when things can go badly. All right. So we want to make sure that we're placing these in areas where they're conspicuous, uh, conspicuous, we're gonna see them, right? But they, they're not obstructing traffic, right? So we're never going to put them in a travel lane, right? And off on the shoulder is great, uh, just over on the side of the road is fine, but we do not wanna have it in the middle of, a of, of an active traffic lane. All right, so here's a great photo to just kind of show you the effects of lights at a nighttime roadway incident and how its effect that it has on the visibility of motorists coming at you, right? So the glare that's coming from these emergency lights um, can help, it can actually obscure what's going on around. It can obscure our vehicles, it can obscure the emergency, and worst of all, it can obscure us, the responders, and, and uh, make it harder for us, for the motorists to see us, right? 
uh, it can be difficult for motorists to see through all of the glare. So like I mentioned before, look at things like light shedding, uh, which is turning off lights to improve some visibility for motorists, but we're not turning off all the lights. This is looking at some lights that are you know, inside the scene, not the ones that you're first gonna see, but a little bit inside the scene, maybe we start shutting down some of the lights and that can take some of that glare away. All right. We don't want to have, you know, uh, traffic. Uh, we don't. We also don't want to have, be standing if we're directing traffic. We we do not want to be standing behind headlights. Right. The headlights will wash us right out. The oncoming motorists will not see us. Uh, so turning off the headlights of the vehicle that you are standing in front of is definitely important. Right. And you can see here how, you know, the reflected, the, the visibility really gets improved when we start adding signs, when we start adding markers, uh, in this case, the tubular, the, uh, the, the large barrel markers, uh, you can see how much visibility can improve out there, right? And this is how we use channeling devices to help us to direct traffic, all right? These, these channeling devices will provide a way and the motorists will see it. They'll look at that path of least resistance and that's the way that they're going to want to be going. All right, and here's a good example again, some firefighters, they're just wearing their turnout gear, right? Very difficult to see them when they're up alongside the apparatus like this and to know that those are firefighters there. If they were wearing their high visibility uh, vests, much, much more likely that we'll be able to see them and uh, that the motorists will be able to respond. Okay, now we're gonna start talking about temporary traffic control zones. And you might see TTC on there a bunch, that's the temporary traffic control uh, zone that we're talking about. So what this is, is it's a concept for safely defining, managing and controlling the roadway incident, All right? So the idea behind the TTC is to provide long range visibility for, and warning uh, for oncoming motorists. Um, we want to provide obvious options for those motorists as they come up. We don't want them to have to guess at where they have to go. It should be very clear on where they have to go. Uh, we want to give them enough decision time uh, to, to, make the cha to make changes in their driving that need to be made to follow the new uh, traffic patterns. And we want to maintain, as well as we can, a well-managed traffic flow. Um, you know, we can get pressure quite often as well from, uh, you know, from highways personnel, uh, because our roadways are major arteries for commerce, right? Uh, a lot of goods and services flow on our, on our highways and shutting them down costs money to those companies that are, that are transporting those goods and that are stuck behind these things. Um, it, you know, it costs time for others, but so we want to try and manage that flow. We also want to be, you know, respect the motorists who are driving. Maybe they need to get to the airport. They're picking up their kids. We want to keep that traffic flowing if we can. Um, but I also want to mention that if at any time you feel it's unsafe, uh, you, that shutting down the highway is an option for you. Um, and, uh, we call it redirecting traffic in our business because really it's the police who have to te technically shut down the roadway but redirecting traffic backwards is okay. So again, that uh, properly setting up a traffic control zone will significantly reduce the risk of exposure for all of our personnel and the members of the public and citizens who are on the traffic scene. All right, so, our so the primary functions of our temporary traffic control zone are so we want to inform motorists and road users of the incident up ahead. And we want to provide guidance and information of the path to follow through the incident area. All right, so alerting road users and establishing the well-defined path to guide road users through the incident area, it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve to protect the, our responders uh, and those of us working at the incident scene. It's going to help uh, moving road users expeditiously past or around the traffic incident. We're going to reduce the likelihood of secondary crashes if we do this right, and we're going to make it unnecessary to use, you know, sur any surrounding ro local road systems. And sometimes we can redirect. But that's going to increase traffic on roads that weren't necessarily designed for it as well. All right, so we've got here um, a good example of a traffic control zone. 
so a well-designed uh, emergency scene will have these five areas in their in their traffic control zone. All right, so five areas. Uh, and these five areas, we're going to go into some detail. And the five areas are the advanced warning area. And you see that at the bottom of the slide there, the advanced warning area. Uh, second space there is the transition area. The third is the buffer space. The fourth is the work area, and that's where the actual incident is. And the fifth is the termination area. So again, we're going to go through each of these a little bit here. So when we talk about number one, the advanced warning area, what that is, it basically serves to warn motorists of a potential hazard that's ahead. Um, we often use the signs or emergency vehicle, uh, emergency scene ahead signs. Uh, that's what this, uh, that's what the purpose they're used for, that advanced warning. Let them know before they see the incident. And uh, just remember the signs, they need to be in a, in, a, in a highly visible place that's not going to obstruct traffic. So number two, we call it the transition area. And uh, basically the transition area contains a taper of no less than four cones or tubular markers. And it directs traffic away from the accident scene and into uh, the clear or open lane. And you can see how that works there, the way that it, uh, the transition area has the taper of, it looks like five cones uh, in, our, in our slide here. And it would direct the traffic out and around to the left of the incident scene. So number three, the buffer space. Uh, the buffer space is an area just before the scene that's that's uh, free from obstruction. So there's nothing there really. And, and it basically it's there to provide us with an extra margin of safety. All right, that little bit of buffer area there, if something was to ram into that engine, it has a space that it can go uh, where there are no responders or, or other vehicles that it can, that, uh, that will be affected by it. Right? It gives uh, motorists a chance to regain control of their vehicle or stop if they fail to respond to the directional devices in that taper. All right, So vehicle makes a mistake, they end up you know, <laughs> heading into our zone. That buffer space just gives us that little bit of extra room for them to be able to regain control and get back where they need to go if they didn't end up heading some apparatus on the way through. All right, number four. So here we have the emergency scene or the work area, the incident is the incident location. So we want to clearly identify this area. All right. Um, basically, it's going to include debris uh, and we may want to have piles of debris in different areas, but this is there is going to be debris in this area. Um, and this emergency scene is going to be closed off to the public uh, and we can use by using the channeling devices. So we're keeping people away by using our uh, cones or tubular markers. So the final area is the termination area. Termination area can, uh, contains another taper to direct traffic back in to its normal traffic path. All right. We'll go through each of these areas in a little more detail now. All right, so number one was our advanced warning area or notification to drivers. So, Oncoming motorists need to be warned that there's an incident in progress. We, so that gives them enough time to make necessary adjustments to their speed and their direction of travel. Um, the traffic is, noti is notified that the normal traffic pattern is gonna change up ahead, but do not need to move from their normal path quite yet in this area, right? So this area basically begins with the first indication or you know, whether it's a warning sign, lights, flares, whatever you're using uh, to try and give them that advanced warning. So it begins with that first uh, indication to motorists that normal road conditions have been altered. And, it's, it's, and the advanced warning area extends until basically where the first cone, flare or flagging person uh, at the beginning of the transition, area, transition zone is. So, Lack of a proper advanced warning area is one of the major causes of responder death and injury. All right. And I know a situation where we had somebody we know who was a, who was traveling on the highway um, in the, at night. Uh, and all of a sudden they caught something from the corner of their eye uh, coming over the side of the bank. And it was like there was something reflective there, ended up having to swerve to get out of the way and ended up wrecking their vehicle. It was a firefighter coming out from the coming out from beside the roadway. 
uh, who uh, there was a there was a scene up ahead that they had responded to. There was no advanced warning. There was nothing to tell this motorist that uh, that there was something up ahead. All of a sudden, they were confronted with somebody kind of coming out, you know, with a with a with a sign and and with their uh, uh, with their turnout gear on, and they had to uh, make evasive maneuver. Uh, which ended up wrecking their vehicle. Um, fortunately, they didn't injure the responder, but I can tell you that that whole thing could have been avoided with adequate uh, pre-warning and a, an advanced warning area. So you can see here that we have the perception distance, right? We can know how far we can perceive what's going on basically at 100 kilometers an hour, like we have on the, si uh, on the, uh, on the slide here. Our perception distance is about 80 meters. So we want to have at least at 80 meters of an advanced warning area. So we want to see it well before we're reaching our actual emergency scene. And before we can perceive that emergency scene, we will see this advanced warning area. So some things to keep in mind here, you know, poor weather condition, sorry. One, one question about the distance. Is it always 80 meters or is it just 80 meters per one speed level? It's 100 or is that kind of... We'll get it, We'll get into some more about the distances actually coming up in a couple of slides here, but that was specific to the 100 kilometers an hour. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so the advanced warning area, uh, poor weather conditions, limited visibility, curves, and hills can interfere, can, can interfere with, uh, with our ability to see these advanced warning signs. So when our perception distance is reduced from one of these factors, we want to increase the amount of warning that we have that we give to compensate, right? So we can always adjust the length, right? And we'll talk about minimum distances. But again, these are the, the distances we discuss in here are minimums, right? We might want to be adjusting to be, you know, if the speeds are much higher than what we're talking about in these slides. If we're talking about a higher volume of traffic, poor weather conditions, poor visibility, and the terrain maybe is up and down and gives us less opportunity for this warning, we can always increase the, uh, the, the warning area. If I, you know, if the guideline says minimum, you know, you're supposed to have 80 meters, you know, like we had on that slide that I showed before, and I go back 80 meters and it's right, uh, you know, on a turn. You know, am I going to be setting up my my advanced warning area, my 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 sign right on a turn? Unlikely, I'm going to want to do that. I'm going to want to set it up before the turn, like you know, even push it farther out from our emergency scene so that it's before the turn and drivers are given just that little bit extra warning that they can slow down while they go around the turn, as opposed to being surprised or missing it altogether when they're concentrating on their driving. Right. So just remember, the intent here is to make the approaching traffic aware of the crash um or the fire scene or whatever you're at right and to give them that enough time for motorists to adjust safely and to avoid the situation that's the entire intent here so we're talking about minimums right um so for low speed streets uh advanced warning signage should be a minimum of 60 meters from the start of the transition area all right so we're talking about streets of up to about 60 kilometers an hour we talk about 60 meters minimum from the scene. And you can see that's, uh, I don't know if that's exactly, if that's 60 meters there, but that's what the arrow says. So let's go with it. Um, but you wanna have that 60 meters on, and this is just for low speed, right? Um, distances in meters should be increased to approximately 1.5 to three times the speed limit on higher speed roads. All right, so we wanna consider our sight lines created by corners and hills uh, when we're placing advanced warning signs. All right, so again, like I talked to you about the corners, when I talked to you about the hills, we'll get into that a little bit here as well. Um, so traffic speed and volume can greatly impact the design of that control zone. High speed traffic uh, requires much more advanced warning and stopping distances and uh, definitely presents a higher uh, potential risk for a serious secondary accident occurring while we're on a scene. Uh, a vehicle traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, much more lethal than the same vehicle traveling at 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and remember that heavy traffic flow can result in severe congestion, uh, confusion, driver frustration, right? Confused and frustrated drivers often are going to act in irrational or dangerous manners. Uh, they're not going to obey our signs, our control devices, our instructions, and they're going to put us at risk. So again, like we were talking there and like Slade had asked, up to 60 kilometers an hour, that 60 meter minimum is fine. 70 kilometers an hour or more, 
80 meters is the minimum you want to have for that advanced warning area. And I, you, I always err on the side of a little further out, right? We need to find that nice balance though. If you put it too, too far out, it ends up, you know, if we put it, a, you know, two kilometers away from the scene or, you know, even, you know, kilometer or so away from the scene, it could end up that people are, you know, forget about it or like, oh, there's nothing going on. Like I haven't come across anything anymore. So they're going to speed up right as they're coming up to your incident scene. So we don't want to put it too far away, but we certainly can't have it too close because then the intent is not, it's not going to meet our safety requirements. All right, so I was talking a bit about advanced, no, about uh, about um, sight on curves and on, on turns in the road, right? So that adequate sight distance can be an important factor, right? Gives the driver enough time to perceive and react to the hazard. So when there is some kind of horizontal view obstruction, uh, so in this case, you can see, uh, you know, there's a corner and uh, they put a little bush there as well. So that motorist, you can see the sight line presented that, that, that they have, they can see right ahead. They're not gonna see that sign for uh, until they start into their turn, which is actually gonna take a little while to get around that bush and get around the turn. So that's not really gonna give them a lot of heads up time. And now they only have whatever that 80 meters or so to be able to slow down by the time they get to the zone, as opposed to being able to prepare for it as they're coming up to it. Uh, so when you determine that there's a horror, when there's a, a, some kind of obstruction, steps need to be taken to move the setup backwards to a point that allows the oncoming motorist more perception time and more reaction time. They can see it sooner, they can react sooner, right? So if we see something, instead of setting up a scene like this, we want to set up the scene more like this, right? So now we have a good horizontal sight distance, right? We can see that emergency scene traffic sign. It's given us that extra area. Um, basically, by backing it up, it gave them more perception time, more reaction time, and uh, we've increased our safety level by doing that. So it's not just curves when we're turning that, that, that could be obstructions. Going up hills, we also see that there can be obstructions as well. Now you can see the sight line of the motorist in this one, right? We have a steep grade, they're coming up a hill, placing the sign right at the, you know, right over the bank of the hill can, can definitely lower the amount of time that this, the uh, perception time that this driver that's approaching this sign is gonna have, right? The steep grade impacts the visibility of that control device. So what do we do in a situation like that? Am I gonna move it back closer to the scene? Am I gonna move it back further away from the scene? And I think if you guys have been listening, you know the answer to that quite clearly is to move that back a little bit further, right? Now the driver has sight of it, right? And it's farther away from our, our emergency scene, yes, but we've increased the perception and reaction time for that driver coming up that steep grade. So heavy traffic flow is another one of the thing we need to be concerned about. So it can result in that severe congestion, confusion, and driver frustration that we've talked about. Um, and, that, and, and just can't reiterate enough that, that confused or frustrated drivers act in irrational and dangerous ways often. Uh, they may fail to obey our signs or control devices or our instructions. Uh, I do want to mention, though, that if you come across um, confused, frustrated, irrational drivers and uh, we are not there to take abuse either. Uh, you should disengage. We are not looking to cause issues ourselves either, but we want to disengage from the situation. Let your incident commander know, uh, and if uh, if they're on scene, they should be passing that along to the RCMP, or if you or if you feel comfortable talking to the RCMP and letting them know. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I've been, uh, you know, another call I was at one time, where you get called out to a motor vehicle accident. Uh, we get out there, uh, and it's a pretty bad one. Uh, but as we're out there, we get a call for a second motor vehicle incident. And I get sent out with uh, one of my captains at the time. I was a firefighter, on, a, a you know, newish firefighter on the department. Got sent out with my captain and I was driving, captain in the officer chair. We're going to go find this other one and see if we can help. Um, uh, we went out. We basically just saw a car in the ditch. Tow truck was already there. So we came, we, we decided we'd be coming back to the scene. They still needed us. So we had our lights and sirens going. And we got passed by a uh, motorist coming uh, the same direction we were going. We had our lights and sirens on. And again, it was snowing, it was bad weather. Um, so we weren't going 140 at the time, but I also wasn't exactly crawling, but this guy decided to pass us anyways. They of course got up to where the original accident was and the road was shut down and they ended up at the back of the highway. 
So we, in our command vehicle, proceeded on to the emergency scene, uh, got out, and my captain immediately walked over, talked to the RCMP officer and said, hey, the guy back there at the very end of the line, license plate so-and-so, that guy just passed an emergency vehicle with its lights and sirens on and basic and and made and in a very dangerous way. That that uh, that RCMP officer uh, immediately went and had a little chat with that motorist, and that motorist ended up getting a pretty severe fine uh, for that. So that's what the RCMP are there for. Please don't take this stuff on to yourself. Uh, if, just disengage if you can from the situation uh, and make sure that you have, you know, buddies around as well that can help you, uh, you know, remove yourself from that situation and inform the, the RCMP. Uh, they're the ones who can take care of that. All right. So when we have poor weather, Poor visibility, we want to increase the advanced warning distances that we have, right? Heavy rain, snow, fog, all of that can reduce our driver visibility, right? It makes it harder for us to detect the incident scene or see the emergency personnel on the roadway. Um, so in those cases, we want to increase the advanced warning and, stop, uh, and stopping distances. Uh, we want to ensure that our personnel are visible uh, and maybe think, you know, and consider using more signs, more lights, more flares, just, you know, make sure that we are lit up and that people can see what's going on in those inclement situations, right? Um, ice, snow, wet roads, all these can reduce traction and they can also uh, make in loss of traction means people can lose control of their vehicles, right? So in situations where we have that going on, ice, snow, um, wet roads, increase the warning and stopping distance and the advanced warning area because we're going to need those greater stopping distances. Um, the position of the sun and the glare off of wet or icy roads can also affect driver visibility, right? Think about bridge surfaces may be more slippery than the regular road surface and the wind may blow dirt and dust across the road affecting visibility. So take all of these things into consideration uh, in terms of what is, you know, what are drivers facing when they're coming through our scene, right? The point here is that the weather conditions can dictate where and how you establish this traffic control, right? I told you when we have icy conditions, we changed the way that we operated. We decided we weren't going to be responding directly to the scene. We were going to be setting up traffic first and then responding to the scene, whether that's shutting down or setting up, you know, a traffic control. Um, so, you know, in situations like that, think, you know, always consider your safety, the responder safety, and uh, the safety of the traveling public as well as much as you can. So again, the lack of proper advanced warning or approach uh, to approaching traffic is one of the major causes of responder death and injury. Setting up a good advanced warning area is going to be uh, is going to increase our safety, is going to be beneficial for us as responders. And if it's beneficial for us as responders, it's beneficial for those that we're out trying to help as well. Often we're out there protecting police, paramedics, possibly road rescue crews on scene, highway personnel. We're there to help protect all of them, all right? These advanced warning system is that first step that we need to put in place properly to make sure we're doing that, all right? So the second one we talked about that, that I had mentioned was the transition area, all right? So remember, establishing a transition area is a high risk operation, all right? This is, so this is the area uh, that's tapered uh, and used to, to channel the normal flow of traffic into a designated or clear lane around the incident scene. Um, Establishing this is a high risk operation. We have to be out in the traffic. We're right at the front end where traffic is coming as we're doing this, right? We need to proceed with extreme caution when we're setting these areas up, right? Consider shutting it down. Consider you know, getting those advanced warnings uh, out as soon as you can. Consider operating behind vehicles to try and give that extra buffer of safety as well. So we wanna work in pairs, right? Uh, whenever possible. We want to wear high reflective traffic vests and helmets like we are required to by WorkSafe BC. 
uh, we want to focus on the hazards around and try to find a position that offers us escape routes, all right? And it also should be protected, protected by a vehicle, protected by a jersey barrier, protected by something that is a, that is a barrier to prevent a vehicle from hitting you. And again, those escape routes, very important, right? We want to look around and see if somebody was coming at me. I want to have a plan. I am. I can run down this, this ditch over here. I can book it off over behind this vehicle over here. Have your escape route planned in advance if you're going to be doing something in one of the traffic uh, control personnel on this scene. All right. Um, think about worst case scenarios and what you do in those situations so that you're that, that you're ready and maintain your situational awareness. Right. We want to uh, always face the traffic. Right. We don't want to turn our back uh, to the traffic at any time. Right. We want to keep it in our field of view. We turn our back to the traffic. We don't know what's going on. Bad things can happen. Right at night, we want to use a flashlight to help alert motorists to our presence. Right, traffic wands, flashlights. Um, make sure you have their their full attention before you step out into a traffic lane. They should be stopped. You should know you have their full attention. <clears throat> and the last thing we have here is that use a blocking vehicle when possible and park at an angle, the fend off angle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that fend off angle uh, as we go on here. It's actually the opposite angle of what the vehicle is positioned in this picture here. Excuse me, give it a try. <clears throat> All right, so on a two lane road, the transition area <clears throat> may double as the termination area, right? Uh, depending on, on how you've got it set up. We always need to be prepared for the unexpected and always have that escape route or a safe zone to retreat to. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, the we we're talking about transition area, right? The transition taper length should be in meters four times the first number on the speed limit. So basically, for a 60 kilometer per hour, the taper would be four times six or 24. So I'm going to kind of just show you here what we're talking about. So, <clears throat> so basically when we're looking at, again, so we're looking at uh, 60 kilometers per hour speed limit, we're looking at 24 meters that we, in length for the taper area. Again, the first number was a six in the 60, multiply that by four, that's 24 meters long for the taper area. So we're gonna start placing cones and flares from a position of safety. Um, for example, we wanna put them down on the shoulder of the road, like I just showed you here. You see all the cones there, we've put them down on the shoulder of the road, unless the lane was already shut down, then we could go right out and start doing it, right? Um, so we put the leading uh, cones to closer together, maybe two or three meter separation, and then gradually increase the separation space to about seven to 10 meters. If we leave too big a separation between the cones or flares, it may result in drivers ignoring the taper, right? It may take as many as 10 or more cones or flares to establish an adequate taper depending on how, how far it needs to go. So again, now we start putting it out, right? And in this case, we did 10 paces linear. So we went 10 paces down and then one pace to the, and then one pace to the side, 10, 10 more paces down and then two paces. Now you see how we've created that taper using those, uh, using those cones, right? Uh, next we'll do 10 more paces and then three paces up, 10 more paces and then four paces up until we've completed our taper zone. All right, now we'll talk about the buffer zone. And the buffer zone is the space between the transition area and the work area, right? The buffer zone provides that extra margin of safety for emergency personnel. And, uh, and others that are in the work area, all right? We wanna use the same precautions here when we're deploying our cones and flares, all right? We wanna deploy, we deploy our cones and flares along the full length of the buffer zone to discourage motorists from driving into the buffer zone. If you leave an opening in your cones, some driver for whatever reason is gonna see that and be like, oh, I guess I go this way. So we wanna make sure that we don't leave those kind of gaps, all right? We wanna position the apparatus uh, as well to in the blocking position, right? Uh, this is gonna help provide us with a physical barrier before the work area, right? In that buffer zone, you can see uh, we've got the apparatus position there. I put the police car on the outside 
right? Again, those blue lights, I love them on the outside. Kind of puts that vehicle a little bit more in ramming area, but you know, we'll just tell the cop to be careful. The police officer should know and be care be fairly careful and maybe not sit in their vehicle too often. Uh, and it's very un and, and it is less likely with those blue lights you're going to have somebody come up and ram them, but it could happen. Um, reality is though that if we didn't have that there, or the way that our apparatus is positioned is called a fend off. So we've got the the nose pointed out towards tra towards uh, you know traffic. And uh, in this case, if, uh, if somebody was to come up and hit us, they would glance off and hopefully uh, not come and injure our responders in the scene. Hopefully they'd be okay as well, all right? But using that apparatus as a blocker, absolutely. Again, we'd rather replace a half million dollar truck than, than any person. We can't replace people, right? We wanna park at that angle with the wheels turned to protect both the work area and the and when necessary, if we needed to a pump operator, right? So you might need to take into, into consideration what side of the vehicle your pump panel is on when you're doing this as well. If you're going to need to use your pump panel, you might wanna try and position it so that it's on the inside of the buffer zone as opposed to on the outside for fend off. <clears throat> so that angled apparatus can effectively block an entire lane as well, right? So positioning an apparatus upstream of the incident is the most critical initial action that we can that we can take to protect our personnel and to minimize the possibility of a secondary incident. Once we put that up, we've got a bit of a shield, right? Shields up, we've got a huge safety margin just increased by putting that there. So the upstream block also enables first arriving officer to help survey the scene from inside the vehicle. Um, at night, the headlights uh, and vehicle mount spotlights can also be used for initial scene illumination and to be able to see what's going on. All right, so you see here, they've got the front wheels turned away from the incident, right, in that buffer zone. You need to have, so what would happen there is a vehicle comes up from behind, hits it, that apparatus, if it moves, will now move away from the scene and not directly into our first responders that are operating there, right? So we wanna make sure there's enough space between the blocking apparatus and the work area to prevent that apparatus from intruding into the work area in the event of a collision, right? So we recommend that 50 foot hot zone be maintained between the blocking apparatus and, if the, and, the, uh, and the work area, the vehicle crash itself. Uh, if the MVA that we're going to also involves a fire, the minimum distance should be extended to about 100 feet. We want to keep it further back, right? Because we don't want the apparatus to be damaged if, uh, you know, if, if we start having little explosions happening. Um, operators also need to be aware of leaking gasoline and other hazards like down power lines when we're, when we're positioning the apparatus, right? We don't want to be parking necessarily on fluids uh, that may ignite. Uh, on power lines, of course, uh, anything that could jeopardize the safety of the, of the crew, hazardous materials, uh, anything like that. We want to avoid parking in low areas whenever possible as well. Um, if it's a little dip, uh, you know, we can have, you know, gases that are heavier than air can come down there as well and put us in a dangerous uh, situation. Any fluids will travel downhill uh, and end up there. Basically, all the bad stuff will come at us that way. Um, so more than one blocking apparatus might be required in some cases to make sure we have adequate scene protection. Um, don't hesitate to use another apparatus if you think you're going to need to based on the speed of the roads and the conditions out there, right? Um, the police vehicles with flashing lights should be positioned at the leading edge of that buffer zone. Motorists, and, and you know, this is actually a part of the course, motorists do slow down for those blue lights a heck of a lot more than they slow down for our red lights. All right, so now we've got the work area. So this is also the basically known as the incident location. This is where we do the work that we're there to do. So it's the area where we attend to the emergency. Um, it's in this area that our responders are also most likely to develop tunnel vision and start to forget the presence of our traffic hazards, right? Uh, this is where situational awareness uh, can start breaking down, right? We might be aware of all the hazards that are in front of us from our scene, but fail to take into account. We're still on our major roadway here. There are still the high speed traffic uh, traveling past us all the time, right? Uh, so we need to avoid that tunnel vision if we can. Um, so it's also while passing in this area is that drivers are more likely to do that rubbernecking, right? Uh, that's where we might start getting intrusions into our work area unless we have, you know, sufficient cones, flares, uh, and traffic control devices that are out there. 
right? People are taking a look. They're not paying attention to what they're doing. Oh, look, he's taking a baby out of a, into the ambulance. Baby, what's happening there? And bang, and all of a sudden now we've got another and they slammed into, you know, one of our other vehicles. So be aware, even in that work area. So with the work area, we want to make sure that we continue to lay out cones and flares like we did before, right? Um, we, want to, we want to establish an area that's got enough room for our necessary personnel and equipment, right? Uh, it's advisable as well to consider posting a lookout, somebody who can keep an eye on traffic, you know, in the middle there, right in the work area, as, uh, as the other uh, responders are doing the, the job they need to be doing, right? Um, we want to try and keep our activities as far away from traffic lanes as we possibly can. Uh, whenever possible, we want to move personnel, victims, and citizens and operations off of the roadway to a safer location. If we can, if we can eliminate the hazard, move ourselves out of the hazardous situation and others out of the hazardous situation, that should be one of our primary concerns. And that includes, you know, demobilizing as quickly as possible. Um, this is where you're going to find your incident commander most of the time is in this work area. Uh, they're going to be, you know, overseeing whatever operations are going on in there. Uh, it, even if we're, you know, not doing road rescue, we may be doing accountability for everybody that's at the scene. And that includes our first responder partners who are amazing, uh, our BC ambulance personnel, our RCMP, uh, that could include, you know, BC Hydro, Fortis Gas, it could include, you know, MOTI, AIM uh, Roads as well. There are so many different responding agencies that we may end up working with on the scene. And if we, when we show up as a fire department, because of our training in incident command and accountability, uh, there are many times when we do end up taking command of these scenes, even if we aren't doing, you know, even if we aren't the, the, the organization doing a rescue or doing patient care, uh, we can help with the accountability and we can just help with the overall oversight of the scene to protect everyone's safety. And that's really what that, the job is there, right? So we also want to control the movement of, of personnel in this area. Don't let people be in there just pointlessly wandering around, right? This goes for everything we do. We don't freelance. We don't have a job. We just, we, we wait in a manning pool, right? And we wait uh, somewhere in a safe location uh, until we are assigned a task, right? No wandering around, no freelancing. Um, it's a good idea to keep ambulances positioned in this area as well. Um, normally we want them downstream from the traffic a little bit away from incident hazards so that patients can be safely loaded and so that they can leave the incident scene fairly easily and, and be able to quickly get uh, on their way to hospitals. Um, any unnecessary personnel and equipment should be taken away, they should be removed from this area. If like the more people we have out there, the more targets we have out there, right? Um, you know, I, I have no problem if we have enough adequate personnel uh, and we start seeing that there's people that we don't need there, let's start demobilizing, let's get them out of the way here, all right? Uh, again, people, uh, personnel is at the greatest risk when we're operating in close uh, proximity to the apparatus. So these guys here at the back of the apparatus, they're back in risk right now, right? So we need to keep that in mind. The safest place to be would be on the other side of the apparatus, far enough away that even if it gets hit, you're able to be out of the way. Um, again, if somebody was to ram into the back, the way they have their wheels positioned, the vehicle is going to go out and away from, the, from our work area. If they were to hit the side of the apparatus, the vehicle should hopefully hit a glancing blow and itself go into the lane traveling and not end up moving the apparatus too far over to the side. So again, you can see here with the work area, we want to mark it always with a continuous line of cones. You leave, one, you leave a gap in it, people are gonna think that's a gap for me to come in and tell you about what the jerk did down the road or the RCMP, I gotta tell you, this guy went around me, I, I don't care. I don't want people coming into my scene. You keep cones there and somehow it's like a magical force shield that people just do not cross. Uh, as soon as you open it up, people see it as an invitation to come and chat. Keep that continuous line of cones going. And now for the last section of our traffic, uh, temporary traffic control zone, uh, the termination area. So the termination area, termination area it provides a safe uh, area for traffic to clear the work area. Um, and it ends with a cone or flare, some kind of taper basically at the end, allowing traffic to return to normal operations. So um, yeah, again, it gives us a safe place where, we, the, where traffic can go back to normal operations using cones in a taper pattern.
So with the termination area, we want the, uh, the, the taper section basically indi indicates to the drivers that, uh, that that's the end of the traffic control zone. Uh, drivers often are going to get impatient as they near the end of the traffic control zone, so they're going to want to get going back as soon as possible. They're probably already impatient from having to wait for so long, miss their plane, my kids are going to be angry. So again, just uh, still irrational and, and uh, frustrated drivers there. Um, we want to make sure that we're using those sufficient cones or flares to discourage cutting back into the lane early, right? We don't want people to try and make crazy moves uh, or leave open an option for somebody to make a crazy move uh, that's going to put other motorists at risk and cause a secondary collision. Now we're going to have to be there for a while. Um, on a two-lane road, this can double as a transition area for traffic going the opposite direction. So depending on how you've got it separate, how you've got it set up, this could also be the transition area. The taper zone could be the transition area going the other direction. Okay, folks, at that at this time, I'm going to uh, stop part one. And uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them now. <laughs>